Thank you for having us here today. My name is Alex Peru. I'm Sarah Willis. We're representing Roger Williams University's engineering program. Um, today we're going to discuss a combined horizontal wind turbine and PV K-12 STEM demonstration kit. Our mentor and advisor, Dr. Charles Tangaraj, wished he could be here today, but he's with Engineers Without Borders at a conference. So the basis of our presentation today is to show our development of a STEM education demonstration kit. Um, we're trying to use originality and practical application to stimulate learning. Um, our hope is to create creative class materials such as wind and solar power to um, inform about sustainable energies for children. Without a doubt, gas is cheap. Almost makes you want to visit home a little more. But um, occurrences like this put green energy on the back burner for most people. Um, it's made easy to think short term, but environmental issues are disappearing. A lot of change may lie in the education system. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is what STEM stands for. Technical jobs are in high demand all over the world, particularly in the United States. It has an abundance of job openings in these sort of fields. All positions needed in these sophisticated jobs are not being filled to, to many unqualified participants. STEM is focused on greatening odds that these jobs will be filled by STEM li literates including women and minorities, by exposing these fields to students while they're still developing. This graph shows a projected increase in various STEM-related related fields. On average, there will be a 31.16% increase in STEM-related jobs by 2020. New curriculum and standards are concentrating on preparing students with skills they need for college and career success. Many education leaders want to explore new classroom materials and resources to expose their students to new learning environments. Oftentimes in college you have a lot of labs and things and you need to know how to use the materials in the labs. The percentage, percentages shown will hopefully increase the STEM programs to become more valuable to students striving towards professional careers in higher education. So on the left is your typical wind turbine lab. It's pretty basic. It just has leaves and a simple turbine. And the right two photos are what we have designed um, to introduce innovation to labs. <clears throat> we have a model here. This is one of our older models that have been made <clears throat> that have been improved since. And what is shown here is our horizontal turbine and PV in the middle photo. Um, the PV um, is just bought from um, Omega Engineering, and the um, head was 3D printed. So what the object of the head portion of it is supposed to do is supposed to take horizontal flowing air and direct it downwards into the PVC barrel, which in turn turns this small turbine. So this demo kit is designed to be different than what you may typically see in a STEM education program. Like I said, it consists of a 3D printed head, which acts as airflow redirection. This takes the horizontally flowing air and redirects it straight down. Um, we also have a solar component to design to maximize energy output of the structure, um, which also provides a general understanding of how solar power components work. Our thought process is that this is innovative enough and a new concept to most people, but yet still understandable for people without a higher education to understand. And the demonstration and testing can easily be completed in any classroom environment. Um, the pedestal, a pedestal fan can serve as airflow and putting the unit next to a window can easily provide ambient light to power an LED. So now here are a few of the designs that we had started with. Um, we had found through testing that none of these were very, um, very proficient in any sort of test that we tested for them. Um, so we didn't decide to make any physical models out of these. Now here's an overall cost of what this may run for a STEM program. Um, as you can see, it's under $400. Um, the, oops. the most expensive component is the 3D print, which as you can see was, for us was $300. 
but 3D printing technology is on the rise and this can easily be reduced in upcoming years. And here shows a flow analysis of what we ran in SolidWorks. Uh, the first picture is anticipated flow that we had just at a conceptual phase. Um, this is kind of what we anticipated this um, design to operate like. Then on the right is an actual SolidWorks demonstration, um, uh, which we ran from various wind speeds from 5 to 10 miles an hour, and, or sorry, 5 to 80 miles an hour. And it produced satisfactory results, so we decided to 3D print this one. The test setup that we used, we created a controlled environment to test it that would simulate real life um, applications for our model. And what we did is we just set up a box fan, a fixed distance away from the unit to um, simulate atmospheric air and wind. Uh, the turbine and solar panel were then connected to an LED diode which provided visible stimulus for power generated. And we found that the demonstration kit served this purpose that takes solar and wind potential energy and converts it to electricity. And we found for this it was sufficient enough results to use in PV or in STEM, de STEM demonstration programs. And here again is the final design that we had created. Um, and during testing it was discovered that for the size of the turbine, it wasn't optimized for slower speeds, um, so we realized that there can be some improvements on our model. Um, we created a one to nine scale model. Um, it's in construction right now. This is, the picture is pretty much as far as we've come so far. Um, we plan to implement this design as soon as the assembly is completed. Um, Under controlled conditions and following standard design principles, the combined horizontal wind turbine and PV stem kit provided to be functional and met all the criteria. Um, we'd like to thank Roger Williams University for our scholarship to do this and this conference and our lab space at our school and the engineering lab manager, John Dorothy. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, like Soon said, I'm also from Roger Williams University. I'm currently a sophomore in the uh, electrical engineering track. My research that I did over this past summer was uh, about an energy audit of our local town. Um, so this energy audit was first to basically decide what this municipality does, what they use, how much energy they use day to day by looking at their bills and uh, national grid consumption. For this, we plan to use two tools, uh, two free online tools from the Department of Energy. Uh, the first is the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. So it's made by the same people who brand out all of our uh, refrigerators, computers, everyone sees those little Energy Star tags. It's the same exact thing. And also the Department of Energy's Asset Scoring Tool. Uh, similar tool. They both have their uh, benefits and uh, their pros and cons, basically, and that's what I'm going to be reviewing today. So first, the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. This was used to tr uh, basically track the base energy consumption throughout each municipality. Uh, these, uh, each building has a different variance, so I could do an energy audit of this whole building call it a school complex, and it would give me different parameters that I would have to fill out based on the building. Uh, throughout our research, we found that some of the, these parameters weren't uh, particularly important because it asked things like, what are the opening and closing hours? How many humans are in the building during the day? Um, and we found that that doesn't really affect your energy usage throughout the day, and that doesn't provide any more conclusive results uh, that will push us to greater findings on what we can do to make this a more energy efficient building. So these are some examples of the outputs from the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. At the top left there we see a base score of an uh, uh, example building. At the top right we see our graphs. We decided that these graphs were not good enough for our research and we needed something a little bit better. So 
Later I'll talk about more of us figuring out our own algorithm where we can produce better graphs than this to provide conclusive uh, results to this municipality. Next is the asset scoring tool. This is similar to Energy uh, Star Portfolio Manager, but this does require a little bit more advanced information. So this requires things like the HVAC specifications, the R value for insulation in the buildings, windows, uh, things of that sort. Uh, this model gives you a better understanding of consumption based throughout the building, so we can see which room and where consumes the most, which room and where releases the most energy. Uh, so this was also a very helpful tool, but we also found with this tool that its recommendations that it was programmed to respond to us were consistent for every building. Every building we were told to put in better light bulbs, increase the insulation values, and things like that. So again, we decided that these two online tools weren't great enough for our uh, energy audit and the decisions that we wanted to make because in the end we were focused on making sure this municipality knows what to do next and where to move on. Uh, so these are kind of some of the benefits and challenges of each of these tools that I went over. Uh, with both of the tools, they each have their restricted building types, and that was one huge factor because in our municipality, it's a very small town, uh, the town of Bristol, we have some very old buildings that do not fall under those building types. So those buildings weren't even classified any, under any of the uh, final uh, data markups. Um, that was really something that pushed us to that final algorithm. So we wanted to create our own benchmarking solution and this would provide us with our own conclusive information about what we can do for this town and municipality. Uh, we focused more on the gas and electrical usage just based on the bills that this municipality provided from us straight from National Grid. Um, pretty straightforward, you'll see that in a little bit. This was our algorithm that uh, we used. Basically all we did is we took the kilowatt hour usages, uh, turned it into kilo British thermal units, took the therms usages, translated that into kilothermal British units, and divided it by feet squared. So that gives us an energy use intensity per square foot uh, of that building. So it really broke down the usage of each building into something uh, a little bit more understandable. And uh, this was a huge deal for our municipality because we do have some older folks working there. The, they are the people inputting this data. They need to understand what's going on. And with Energy Star Portfolio Manager, it was a lot of complex things that only us engineers would know. So we really wanted to simplify this system. So this is what our Excel spreadsheets look like. These uh, spreadsheets actually auto-populate. So the one thing you have to input is the date so your monthly billing cycle and how much it says on your billing statement of how much you use. Everything else will auto-populate um, and pr produce these conclusive results that we found. So these are two different graphs uh, we can see of this town. First we have the consumption versus temperature. Here we have a negative 84.5% correlation uh, between these two curves meaning that the usage is very, very dependent on the temperature. So as we see the temperature drop, the usage rises uh, incredible amounts. To the graph on the right, we see that the total usage versus gas correlation is around 96.5%. So that uh, confirms our previous notion that the gas usage is higher in the winter months and that's why we see this negative correlation on one side and the positive correlation on the gas usage. Um, this provided us with the results of we need to better insulate these buildings and that's how we're going to get better energy efficiency throughout this whole municipal complex. Now both Portfolio Manager and the Asset Scoring Tool worked fine for logging this information and for providing some conclusive results but in the end the algorithm that we uh, came up with was the best for doing all of these buildings at once. We were able to do each individual building very quickly, and we were also able to do the whole town-wide consumption uh, quickly as well. 
So uh, it became clear that any future research that could be done should be based on this energy uh, benchmarking tool that we created ourselves and we recommend to the Energy Star and the portfolio manager or the portfolio manager and the asset scoring tool to simplify their data usages a little bit more so it will be more user friendly and uh, that's basically what we are looking for in the end result of this research. Uh, we are focused on making sure that our municipality that we were working with understood what their consumption was and what they can do because they just figured, oh, we'll, we'll purchase some solar panels and put it on the roofs of all our municipal buildings and that's going to solve our issue. And it turned out that wasn't it at all. Um, it really came down to their gas usage and because they have so many old buildings that aren't insulated correctly, that was uh, the biggest factor here. Uh, so that's all I have. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah. Uh, I noticed in your usage versus temperature graph, uh, you were talking about gas. Did you notice the exact opposite with electricity? Yeah, so we see here at the bottom right, did you see that little green line at the bottom? That's our electrical usage. So when this town came to us and said, hey, would it be a good idea to put in solar panels? We showed them this and we said, no, not at all. Like, look at your electrical usage for the whole town. It barely affects your total energy usage. And that, this is what made it uh, really, really helpful to make these changes in this town. And they're actually putting through a policy change right now to make some changes, which was kind of cool for us because they're quoting our research and making changes. Yes, sir. So I believe your, your algorithm you showed uh, was based on square footage. Yeah. And I was wondering why it was square footage and not cubic footage, accounting for like the different heights of the rooms. Yeah, so we just did the basic square footage uh, because also what we found was in this asset scoring tool, they did the, the uh, cubic square, but when you're not in, taking into account the windows and the HVAC system and things like that, that's really when you want to see the feet cubed. When we're looking at feet squared, we're just looking at the base usage and our algorithm wouldn't have worked with feet cubed because we were only looking at the two basic uh, consumptions. And what we decided throughout this research was that you don't need the feet cubed. Well, you're gonna see the same results either way um, and they're gonna give you the best recommendations either way. And that's really what we were looking for. We weren't looking for exactness, we were looking for what is the best way to make a recommendation to these municipalities. Yeah? How do you figure out the source of, say, energy leakage in this kilowatt hours, uh, the, the source in the building, which is causing this high energy consumption? And then how do you make uh, recommendations based on your algorithm. Yeah, so uh, based on our algorithm we can see here, the biggest thing would be our uh, energy consumption graph you see on the right side. That's what uh, produced our best recommendations because we can see that the gas usage was higher throughout all of these months. And that's what we can show is, look, there's obviously something going on here. We know that the buildings are old. The insulation obviously isn't good enough, and that was where we provided our conclusive results from. Um, it doesn't. It, we re recognize that it didn't have to do with more of the technical aspects, but it was pretty straightforward. That hey, look at this old building. Let's do something about it. Let's put in some new windows. Let's put in some better insulation, and that's what's going to change uh, and lower your consumption throughout the year. Yeah. Um, did you uh, did you separate your or categorize your investigation based on types of buildings? Did you s split um, and look at like buildings made after this date have this consumption and buildings made before this date have this consumption and so on? Yep, and that's what we did with the Energy Star uh, portfolio manager. And some of the buildings that we were looking at only used gas because the buildings were so old, or some buildings only used electrical because they didn't need it to be heated in the winter because it was just a garage. Um, and we actually omitted that from our uh, final results because we didn't want to have a bias. There's actually a note at the bottom. We didn't want to have a bias say of because this building only uses electrical, it'll contribute to the electrical side more. Um, so we did take a look into that and we were able to find that the buildings that are newer, yes, they're using LED light bulbs, they have better windows, they have better insulation, and those are what actually made this average a little bit uh, closer together. 
Yeah. Uh, how were you able to? Th uh, earlier, you said that you were ignored occupancy mm -hmm. and kind of like entrances and, and into buildings. Um, if your graphs are showing that the bulk of the usage is thermal management, uh, how does how did occupancy not play a factor in that? So this was just based on the usage. We weren't looking into the occupancy or open closed door usage. Um, say the air being flowed out. We did find that in town hall, that's where we saw our highest spike in usage because that is a high traffic area. And we uh, mentioned that in our final results in the paper. I just skipped over that in uh, the presentation. Well, we have time just for the last question. Yes. Can you tell me what the scale bar is on the y-axis? On the y-axis? Uh, on which graph, the right or the left? Well, I mean, just uh, both of them. Okay, so the, the right side, side, the right graph is uh, KDTU. So that is uh, Kilo British Thermal Units. That is the standard that we translated everything into. On the left side, it is uh, energy use intensity. And that is the uh, use intensity per square foot of the building. What's the difference between your maximum and minimum energy usage over the course of a year? The difference, it, you can see uh, on the left side, we have about 14 high and, what is that, like eight low. So our maximum to minimum 14 to eight isn't that large, but when we see that large change be highly correlated to gas up to 96%, that's when we can make those conclusive results that there needs to be a change in uh, insulation values. All right, thank you, Ethan. Very good. So, hi, I'm Max Bender, I'm from Connecticut College. Um, you might not totally understand like what this talk is going to be about based on the title if you haven't really studied uh, algorithms before, but we'll try and get into a leading example first just to sort of get into the problem. So, in this uh, example, I'm going to be a ski rental owner, uh, and I'm going to have a set of skis that I'm going to be willing to rent out to people. Uh, this can be sort of uh, demonstrated by uh, a line, where each of these points on the line that I've marked is a ski size that I own. And one at a time, a uh, customer is going to come in and they're going to request a ski size. So the first ski size that they're going to request is a size 6. Now I have a size 5, so I think, okay, you know, that's pretty close. We'll, set, we'll sell this guy the size 5 and, you know, go on with it. The next size that's going to come in is going to be a size 8. And I say, okay, well, I've still got a size 8. We'll give you that size. Great. Perfect. But now a new customer comes in and they've got a size 5. Now I've already given away the size 5 ski, so the best thing I can do at this point is say, all right, well, we're going to have to settle for the size 7. Now we have two skis left, and two more customers are going to come in with each of the size 11, and I'll give them the two remaining ski sizes. Now, looking back, it feels like we probably could have done better. Um, as we can see, we kept track of the sum and the maximal difference between any uh, ski and the size requested. Um, and we asked ourselves, well, could we actually have done better? And if instead of giving the size 5 ski to the person who requested a size 6, if we had given that to the person who came in as a size 5, uh, the sum goes down and the total and the maximal difference also goes down. So, uh, us being computer scientists, we like to be kind of precise about the kind of questions that we'd like to ask. So, we asked ourselves, can we actually come up with a sort of upper bound for how good um, we can really expect to do? Uh, can we like come up with some sort of algorithm that can really reduce this total minimal cost or uh, the maximal difference between any ski size and one given? And we also asked ourselves, well, can we come up with a lower bound for how good any possible algorithm could do on this problem? So we're going to sort of give a bit more formality to this problem. Uh, first, we're going to be given a set of n servers. So this can be the, so the set of skis that we are given in this problem. And then a sequence of requests or customers are going to come in one at a time, also on this uh, real line. And we're not going to know where these customers are going to come in, so we're only going to know where they are when they come in the door. Now, our goal is to construct some sort of matching function that matches the sets of the service of the requests that either minimizes the minimum weight, which is the sum of all the differences between all of the uh, service and requests, or, uh, the bottle, or minimize the bottleneck, which is the maximal difference between any request and its paired server. So to do this, we're going to define the cost of any 
Uh, well, first we're going to define the matching function of an algorithm as the function which is given by our output. So uh, whatever uh, function describes the matching between the requests and the service at the end of the day. We're going to define the cost of that function as uh, either the sum of all the differences between the request and their uh, matched uh, uh, server, or the maximal difference, depending on which objective we're trying to use, the min weight or the bottleneck. Uh, we're also going to just for later define the set of deterministic algorithms for this problem to be A sub D, and set of randomized algorithms to be just that script A. Now, to really like give a very formal um, uh, definition for how good an algorithm really can do here, we're going to define the competitive ratio for any deterministic and randomized algorithm. Uh, uh, the competitive ratio for these algorithms is just going to be the maximal uh, ratio between uh, the algorithm's performance on any specific instance to the optimal matching for that specific instance. Uh, we see that for the randomized algorithms, we have to add a little bit of an expectation there just because of the randomized aspect of them. Now, to come up with lower bounds, it gets a little trickier for randomized algorithms because we have to um, sort of construct a way to actually formally give lower bounds. So when we're given a randomized algorithm, we use something called Yao's principle, which allows us to take the uh, problem of coming up with a lower bound for uh, randomized algorithms into actually just a probability distribution over deterministic algorithms. We'll get into actually how that's applied later. So first, uh, just as an example, we'd like to go over the lower bound of the greedy algorithm. Now the greedy algorithm is just the algorithm that sends every request to its closest available server. So when a request comes in at, say, zero, or really just a number just a little bit bigger than zero, we're going to assign that first request to the server at one, because the server at one is the closest available server at that time, like so. Now when the second request comes in at one, well, we've already given up our server at one. So we have to go to the next closest server, which is now the server at two. And now requests are going to come in one at a time at the server that was just taken up. So uh, we can see that this is going to keep going on like that. Now when our last request comes in, it's going to come in at this final server to the right, but that server was already taken up. So we have to go now all the way back to the server at negative one, which is a very just large gap. And it's pretty clear, I'd say, that we could have done a lot better if we just assigned that first request to the one at the left, then every the remaining request could have just been uh, given to the server it's co-located with. Now, going back to our min weight objective, uh, remember that we defined the uh, cost of this algorithm as the sum of all the differences between the requests and their paired servers. So, just looking at the um, black lines for this part, um, the sum of all of these ends up being an exponential uh, function. Whereas the optimal solution that we just talked about, where we assign the first request to the server on the left, actually just has a cost of one. So we would say the competitive ratio for this problem is, uh, for this algorithm, is at least uh, exponential, at least two to the n minus one, which is pretty bad. <laughs> um, same thing for bottleneck, where we look at the maximal, uh, like the largest edge that we created here. And we see that that's, again, a very uh, exponential function when, again, the optimal solution would have just had a maximal difference of one. So again, the competitive ratio for greedy, even on the bottleneck objective, is exponential. So the previous results for this problem, specifically on the line, are really only there for, uh, the lower bounds really only there for the deterministic problem. Um, and that was uh, 9 plus some very small number, roughly 0 0.001, uh, for the minimum weight objective and a roughly linear uh, bottom objective. The best algorithms known are actually permutation for uh, deterministic uh, algorithms uh, for the total and bottleneck objectives, which achieve a competitive ratio of 2n minus 1. And for randomized objectives, there actually was no established lower bound for uh, the total uh, min weight objective or the bottom objective. The best known algorithm for the total objective was the harmonic algorithm, which is roughly linear, uh, logarithmic. And the best known objective for bottleneck is again actually permutation, which achieves a lo linear uh, upper bound. 
Our results were a lower bound of 2 for the randomized min weight objective and a linear lower bound for the bottleneck objective. So for the minimum weight objective to achieve the lower bound of 2, you actually only need two servers, which is really nice. Uh, the request sequence is actually just um, a first request at just a location of 0, and the second request either arrives at uh, negative a or a for some constant a with 50% uh, probability, i.e. uniform probability. So the expected cost of this algorithm is really just you analyze the two possible scenarios uh, where the request either arrives at the negative a or the positive a, um, and the t uh, total cost associated with each. So since uh, if the algorithm assigns, uh, if the algorithm guesses correctly and assigns the first request to the location of which the second request will not land at, then the total matching cost is just going to be that uh, constant a. Whereas in the other case, if the algorithm guesses incorrectly, then the total cost is going to have a cost of 3a. So this gives us a total expected cost of 4a over 2, which would just be our constant 2a. However, the optimal cost would, of course, just be to uh, be just a. So the competitive ratio for this uh, problem would just be 2, or at least 2. Uh, for the randomized bottleneck objective, it gets a little, a uh, little bit better, a uh, higher lower bound. So for this, we construct an instance where uh, we're going to use 2k servers for some constant 2k, uh, for some constant k, and our first request is going to arrive at zero. Our next two requests are going to arrive at negative one and one, negative two and two, so on, and then our final request is going to land at either negative k or k with uniform probability. Now, what's actually nice about this is that the only thing that really matters at the end of the day is our last request. So after the first 2k minus 1 request, there's going to be exactly one server left uh, because you've had to have matched all the previous requests. So there's, of the 2k initial servers, only one left. So we're going to call that server S. Now, the expected difference between that final server and the final request is going to be the difference between, uh, it's going to be the expected cost of the two, possible, uh, the two possible locations, right? So if the server, if the final request were to land at that positive uh, k server, then the difference is going to be k minus s. However, if it lands at the negative k server, then the distance is going to be s plus k. So adding those two together, we say that the expected cost is just k. Now, uh, the optimal bottleneck edge will actually always just be 1. And to see this, we'll just assume that the final request lands at a, R sub two, uh, at a negative k just for well, that loss of generality. Now, by matching as shown with the arrows, where the first uh, k requests, they are just um, matched to the server that they're co-located with, and all the remaining requests to the one just above them, the maximal difference between any request and its paired server is just going to be 1. So that means that the, bottleneck, the optimal bottleneck assignment here is only going to have a cost of 1. So the competitive ratio here is actually going to be greater than or equal to k, which was the half of the available servers. So this gives us the lower bounds that we talked about before. And what's interesting about this is it actually shows that the bottleneck, the randomized bottleneck objective is a strictly harder problem than the randomized minimum weight objective. Uh, we can see this because the harmonic algorithm, which is the best currently known uh, minimum weight objective algorithm is a logarithmic upper bound. So it will always be doing at least, uh, no worse than a, log, like a, logarith a, con a constant times logarithmic amount of the servers. Whereas our lower bound for the, bottom, the randomized bottleneck objective is actually a linear function. So looking at the uh, asymptotic values of these, we can see that the bottleneck objective is strictly harder than the uh, minimum weight objective. Uh, in the full paper, we also discuss this uh, kind of interesting theorem where for the minimum weight objective, you actually never need to look, uh, when a request comes in, you never need to look at any of the other servers other than the two closest available servers. That is, you never need to like uh, skip over one of your two closest servers to like uh, match it. There's just never any reason to do that. You can still achieve an optimal uh, assignment without doing that. So these are my references. 
I'd like to thank Connecticut College for uh, giving me funding for this uh, project in the past and also for this conference for inviting me to come. Thank you. My name is Julia Proft. I'm from Connecticut College. I'm a senior, and today I'm going to be talking to you about spectral anomaly detection with machine learning for wilderness search and rescue. Um, so you might have been hearing about drones a lot in the news recently, either because big tech, tech companies are planning on using them for delivering packages or because people are flying them by the White House. Um, but what you may not have heard of as much is how responders, first responders, are using drones for search and rescue. So what they can do is they can mount a camera on a UAV, they can go to a disaster area, they can fly it and take a lot of high resolution imagery, and then later they can sit down and review these images looking for anything of interest that could potentially lead to missing persons. So here's an example of an image that a responder might be looking at. They might note that there is some kind of little metal pole there in the middle, a couple of pieces of white debris, um, nothing else really too interesting in this image. And then once they conclude there's nothing there, they'll move on to the next one, and the next one, and they all, they have to scrutinize these all very carefully, because you know, any, like, even the tiniest clue could lead to something that could uh, lead to a missing person. And, and as you might be able to tell, this can get very tedious over time. These all kind of start to look the same, and you've got potentially hundreds or even thousands of these images that you have to sift through. And this is you know, all under very high stress, and it's possible that a responder could miss something. So this motivates the use of trying to use some kind of algorithm to automate the process a little bit and help the responders out. So we sat down with some first responders to ask them, what exactly is it that you're looking for uh, in these images? So some of the things they look for are colors, colors that stand out, because this could be somebody's shirt, for instance. Um, they also look for urban debris, which has uh, straight lines and corners a lot of the time, because that could also give them interesting information. They look for people, naturally, or maybe just like somebody's arm if they're partially occluded. Uh, they look up for amounts of debris that are at least bigger than a person, because there could be somebody um, underneath that debris. And they also look for signs of animals digging or animal tracks because that could lead the victims. Uh, so we hypothesized that we could use the color information um, to detect abnormalities, you know, anything that stands out that a responder might want to look at uh, in wilderness search and rescue images. So we decided to use spectral anomaly detection to do this. Now, in general, anomaly detection is just the process of finding items or events that deviate from some kind of expected model or pattern. So it's different from other kinds of target, target detection in that the, um, what you're looking for is a lot fuzzier. So you know, instead of like facial recognition where you're looking for something very specific, here you're just defining what, what seems to be normal and then anything that is outside that range of normalcy is then an anomaly. And specifically for spectral anomaly detection, uh, that's looking at colors that are different from what the expected norm is. So we decided to use the RX algorithm, which has been the standard in remote sensing for about 25 years now. Um, and basically, it makes a model of the background using a normal process. And it assumes that even if the, the mean color of the image can fluctuate greatly, the covariance is going to vary a lot more slowly. And so basically, it just looks at each pixel and compares it to its model and says, you know, how far away is this from what I was expecting to find? And the farther away it is from what was expected, the higher the Rx score. Uh, so here again is that image, uh, image I showed before. And after running the Rx algorithm, I, you can see that it picks out the metal pole and that largest piece of white debris as the most uh, anomalous things in this image because they show up as darkest red. You can just go back and then compare that. Um, and here's another example where there's a responder there uh, in an orange vest, and you can see on the corresponding uh, anomaly map below that the, the orange vest of the responder shows up very brightly. So we wrote a program that uses uh, the Rx algorithm, and the process is essentially we, we reduce the size of the image um, so that the widest edge is no more than 1,024 pixels, just because we need our program to run quickly. Uh, we compute global Rx scores um, just to distinguish. So the, the Rx algorithm it has a global version, which only calculates the, the mean and the covariance uh, one time using the entire image. There's also a local version, which uses a sliding window and uses neighboring pixels to try to compute these things. Um, we use global Rx uh, because it's faster. I'll talk about that more in a minute. 
Um, then we also thresholded the scores. We only looked for the pixels that were highly anomalous and just um, the ones that were just kind of sort of anomalous. We set those scores to zero just to reduce some of the noise in the image. And then we just normalized it, converted it into an R RBG image like you see, and then concatenated those together and saved up the file. So a question that arises there, you know, like why, why show the responders the RX scores? Why just like not keep it behind the scenes and then try to circle or highlight on the ori original image where these anomalies are? Uh, well, for one, we didn't really want to be drawing anything on top of the original image because that could potentially um, occlude information that they, that they need to see. Um, and it also takes time to, you know, try to cluster and find those anomalies. Um, and another big thing is that uh, the responders a lot of time are viewing these images out on the field on a laptop where there could be a lot of screen glare. And that can make it very hard to see the image you're looking at. In that particular picture there, there's a white board type object that's really hard to see uh, with added glare on the screen. But in the anomaly map below, it shows up more clearly because the anomaly map relies more on pixel intensity than pixel hue. Um, and the reason that we decided to use global RX rather than local RX is because we really, really need this to be fast. Because not only because of increasing danger to missing persons, but also because in a search and rescue mission, the longer it takes, the larger the area is that needs to be searched. Uh, so we just need this to be as fast as possible. All right, so just now to give some context for this research, um, I knew last spring that I was going to go to Texas to do research. I knew it was going to be related to disasters. But what I didn't know is that I would be flying out to Texas just a few days after disastrous flooding. Um, so I'm sure you saw in the news, but um, at the end of last May, Texas experienced very, very massive flooding. Um, and, you know, there was just areas that were completely washed out. There were bridges that were destroyed, um, houses that were just ripped off the foundations, um, and people stranded in floodwaters. Um, so the research focus immediately became figuring out how to help these responders um, do what they need to do and respond to these floods. Um, so what we did was in the aftermath of the flooding, we got permission to uh, take a UAV and fly it over the Blanco River area, um, which was one of the rivers that experienced the most flooding. Um, and so we took 150 images there. And those were the images I was showing in the beginning with like the metal pole and, and that sort of thing. Um, so the images largely were uninteresting. It was just a lot of trees and mud and water. Um, but when we did an initial evaluation, just looking, looking through them, trying to find any objects, uh, we determined that 56 of them had some other kind of object that didn't belong there um, that a responder might want to look uh, at further. So then after we did that initial evaluation, we ran our program on it, and um, it took 2.23 seconds for each anomaly map to be generated and save the file. Um, and then we showed these images in their anomaly maps to first responders and other stakeholders at the 2015 Summer Institute on Flooding, which was sponsored by Texas A&M University and just brought together people from different agencies, universities, and companies to just come together talk about the floods, establish new protocols for responding to those floods, and then do some field work. So some of our results, um, out of the 150 uh, images with 88 million pixels, it flagged 1.14% of them as having some degree of abnormality. Um, and for, as far as all the objects we found when we looked through them, um, on the corresponding anomaly maps, we could see that those were highlighted with bright pixels. Um, and one, one really nice thing was that when we showed it to the responders, they responded really positively. Like there was one guy who even said, you know, I really need something like this. When is this going to be available? Um, so they asked that uh, the application be hardened and eventually released so that they could try it out and, you know, maybe use it in the field in the future. Um, so just to wrap up, so we determined that spectral anomaly detection can quickly locate unusually colored objects in images. Um, taken with UAVs for wilderness search and rescue. And in the future, uh, we would like to do a user study to determine, you know, does having these anomaly maps actually help responders um, find more anomalous objects and that sort of thing. And I would just like to acknowledge that this work was made possible through the National Science Foundation um, as part of the Computing for Disasters Research Experience for Undergraduate Sites. Thank you. Uh,
thank you uh, for coming to this. Um, so I'll be presenting today on the interactions between gliding dislocations in 3CSIC. And basically, 3CSIC is a special, uh, a very special semiconducting material that has a wide variety of applications. And this actually goes back, uh, or my presentation goes back to something that was said earlier in the conference. Um, and it's the fact that as you go to uh, shift to smaller and smaller transistors, you actually, um, you, you actually have these roadblocks, okay? And you actually have to start considering uh, material defects and how those material defects actually lead to electrical degradation. And so, first of all, I want to talk about 3CSIC, um, just the basic material. And it's, 3, uh, 3CSIC is the cubic uh, crystal structure of silicon carbide. Uh, and as compared to hexagonal structures like 4H and 6H, you have increased electron mobility and a higher channel and virgin mobility and low, lower density of states at the interface between silicon and silicon carbide. And this allows for a better semiconducting material in a specific kind of uh, transistor called MOSFETs. And so the main motivation of my research is actually um, <laughs> studying through simulated through Monte Carlo simulations how um, a 19.7% lattice mismatch at the uh, silicon carbide and silicon interface leads to the formation of stacking faults and and then those stacking faults lead to actually other greater electrical degradations okay and by analyzing the simulations uh, uh, by analyzing how um, uh, how these stacking faults actually propagate through the growth of the material um, as the material is grown uh, through simulations, we can actually uh, gain better insight into how these uh, electrical degradation actually happens. So I've been throwing around the word uh, stacking faults a lot, but it actually comes down to um, the basic, uh, the, the first step of the growth of the material, and it's that initial carbonization step where you, where you actually have um, the dislocation of atoms, the wrong placement of atoms in uh, along the uh, uh, of silicon carbide uh, pairs along the silicon surface, and then as that material is grown monolayer by monolayer, those uh, uh, those dislocations actually form these planar defects called stacking faults, and they form along specific planes. And I show these planes right here, where you have uh, on one side the uh, silicon terminated stacking faults, and then the carbon terminated stacking faults. And what this is is that these, uh, these planes are actually four equivalent planes, and they interact with, the, uh, uh, with the, they interact with each other in very special ways. So you can actually have, you actually don't have any intersections between these stacking faults, but you do have the termination of one plane against the other, and you have in, in this image, although it's uh, a little hard to see, you actually have um, expansion and shrinking of stacking faults, but no intersection. And then uh, when we, uh, and then uh, I actually want to talk about my uh, simulations and how it actually works. So the initial step is the initial carbonization. And so uh, the way Monte Carlo simulations work is we have random placement of dislocations in that initial carbonization. And so 19.7%, about 20% of those um, the placement of the silicon carbide pairs are going to be dislocated. And then we have on the right, I show a, a, a step in the simulation further on where you have a single monolayer view. And from this, you can actually see um, uh, that this is a monolayer. And so what you're seeing is just one monolayer of the interactions between these planar defects. And you see no intersections. But then, after the material has actually been grown to its full scale, you actually have an intrinsic stress in the, in, in the material. And this, this stress is actually caused by the mere existence of these planar defects. 
And after uh, when this uh, the exist the existence of this stress actually leads to the gliding dislocations. And the partial dislocations that are gliding are actually just the edges of the sagging faults. So that means that these planes of uh, uh, that the edges of the planar defects are actually deforming those planes, and they're actually uh, and they actually allow for these planes to intersect. And that is the ba uh, m the most important part of my research. It's finding out how actually these um, these dislocations interact with each other. Okay, and the crowd line and point defects that, that I point out, each one of those is a forced dislocation. And the addition of those along a, a single line can actually, uh, is what we believe to be the main source of um, leakage current, of increased leakage current density in, in, semi, in the semiconducting material. So, in my simulation, um, I have the gliding of both silicon core and uh, partial dislocations and carbon core dislocations. But here I show a little animation where I show the gliding of the silicon core dislocations. And basically what happens in that one time step is that you see that the silicon core dislocations are moving at a much, much faster pace than the C core dislocation. It's many magnitudes higher than, than the gliding speed of the carbon core dislocations. And what this means for our simulations is that we can actually just ignore the silicon core dislocations and take into account just one type of edge of the second faults and simulate that. And basically what happens in, in the simulations is that you have an initial, um, an initial gliding uh, orientation for uh, the carbon core dislocations but then each of those are along different planes, four equivalent planes. You have to project that, uh, that gliding um, orient, uh, the, you have to redirect that gliding orientation along those specific planes. And it allows you to rewrite the burgers vector so that they're gliding along the specific, uh, along the right direction. So some of these simulation parameters that I, um, that I have to go over um, in my, uh, that I, there's some assumptions really that I've taken into account is um, really that the stress that I talk about, the intrinsic stress of the system, it's, it's very complicated to actually uh, compute uh, the stress at, 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 different, um, at different points in the system. It's, it's caused by the, the, existence, the existence of the second faults. But, um, but in my simulations, you, um, we actually uh, view the stress as just a probability, a probability of, uh, of uh, what is the probability that a partial dislocation will actually move along their Burgers vectors, and we increase that from 0 to 10 percent. And also, um, I have simulated a 30 nanometer by 30 nanometer by 15 nanometer system, and this is pretty small, and in actuality it might, it doesn't model a, the true size of the system, but that is actually not a problem because the system that I that I simulate is actually an infinite system. It's um, when once uh, when one planar defect exits the system on one side, it actually enters on the other side. Okay, and also I model uh, one thousand iterations of the system, and uh, after a certain number of iterations of after a certain number of movements of uh, for, of the of the partial dislocations, uh, we can actually have, we actually have the maximum inter uh, interaction between the stacking faults. And we have, as a result, the maximum uh, number of forced dislocations created. Okay. So here I show one of probably the best images of the simulations because it's, it's, really, it's really descriptive of what's happening. Um, so the images that I've shown earlier, where I had the, that single view of the monolayer, uh, where you have stacking faults um, interacting with each other, uh, terminating and shrinking and expanding each other, those are during epitaxial, pro uh, during epitaxial growth. And you can actually model that, uh, view that very easily in a two-dimensional, just looking at it two-dimensionally, because it's a monolayer. But 
when we actually deform those planar defects, you have to look at it in a three-dimensional uh, system. And, a, and this, what, what I'm showing right here are actual, uh, the actual porous dislocations that are created. So each of these lines is the lines, the crowd lines of point defects that are uh, created by the intersection of the stacking bolts. All right? And what this shows us is actually that the main source of forest dislocations is, uh, as noted by the blue lines, is actually from the uh, intersection of carbon terminated stacking bolts. And more importantly than that, you see the specific orientation along which these forest dislocations are, uh, along which these crowd lines point defects are created. And here I say that it's in the zero negative one one direction. And, and that's just a, a direction, a specific direction, a specific orientation within the geometry of the, uh, the carbon, uh, of the uh, silicon carbide uh, crystal structure. And if, by knowing that orientation, we actually know along which, orient, uh, along which direction we will actually have the highest leakage current density if we transmit the current in that direction within the material. And it actually, it, it, it's actually very special, this, uh, knowing this direction, because, um, because it, it, one, it's also, the, uh, as I said, the transmission of, of the current within the material, but also, um, it, it actually allows us to explore uh, maybe more fabric, uh, fabric, better fabrication techniques of the actual material, okay? So that um, we can actually uh, create less force to uh, smaller crowd lines of point defects, okay? And I, these, this graph actually shows some of the densities. So the density of stacking faults uh, versus uh, force dislocations. So due to the fact that uh, uh, stacking faults are a Shockley type of dislocation. They have, the, uh, they, they're a constantly moving dislocation, okay? You can't actually achieve zero density. It's, I mean, it's theoretically possible, but it's, it, it won't happen. And um, uh, no matter how thick you make the material, you can decrease it exponentially at the beginning, but then it, it won't act, ever actually reach zero. But then you have the forest dislocations, and forest dislocations are the intersection of, uh, of two stacking faults, right? And, and, that's the, uh, and that's a frame type dislocation, which means it's, it, it doesn't move. It doesn't actually keep moving throughout the system. And you can actually achieve zero, uh, zero density at a certain, uh, at a certain um, level in the layer, at a certain monolayer in the, in the crystal structure. And this, this is actually really special because um, this means that at a certain, if you make the material thick enough, then you can actually avoid um, higher force dislocation densities. You can uh, you can decrease the, um, uh, the leakage current density uh, through that. Okay, um, and here I show a realistic versus an ideal system. Uh, so. I want to talk first about actually the ideal system. In an ideal system, you have no force, uh, no um, silicon, car uh, silicon terminated stacking faults or carbon terminated stacking faults, and as a result, you can't have any interactions between stacking faults. Um, and it, it just proves the logic of the system that you can't create any force dislocations from that. Then we see that in the realistic side, we have a a, a normal density of the uh, silicon terminus stacking faults and the carbon terminus stacking faults. And you, as you increase, as we increase that stress level in the system, as we increase the probability that a partial dislocation will move along its Berger's vector, we increase, we of course increase that, um, the, ch uh, the, uh, the density of the forest dislocations. But what happens when we completely el eliminate one type of stacking ball, and it's been done. It's, it's you can do it. Exper uh, oh, it's been done experimentally. You can eliminate um, silicon terminated stacking faults or carbon terminated stacking faults. But uh, we see that it when it actually skyrockets, uh, and it's very interesting. Um, 
actually, uh, it's it's not necessarily really understood all, all the way why it happens, but you have an increased, um, because there's less uh, less density of one type of second ball, there's less elimination of another type of, and, and, and on the left side you have the type of, there's only silicon terminus second faults. And so you have an increased density of second faults all throughout the system. Um, and then that increase, uh, that leads to just skyrocketing of the forest dislocation density. And, in, and as a result, a skyrocket, uh, in skyrocketing of the leakage current density. All right, so with this, I actually want, uh, my last image, I, I want to talk a little bit about the forest dislocation length. And when I say forest dislocation length, that can be a little misleading. So forest dislocation is the actual point, de uh, point defect, and then crowd line point defects is, is what I'm actually measuring. And we can actually see that one type of, uh, uh, one type of forest dislocation is going to create greater, um, uh, much longer uh, crowd lines point defects. It'll be the main source of leakage current density. And if we can find a way of fabricating, a new, uh, fabricating the material in a way that it actually leads to smaller, uh, smaller lines of, uh, smaller uh, crowd lines of point defects made by the, that kind of forest dislocation, um, then we can uh, decrease the leakage current density. So, um, some of the conclusions that I have, and I want to restate uh, something that I said about the assumptions. So I'm uh, I'm simulating a very small, uh, very small volume, 30 nanometers by 30 nanometers by 15. But given the fact that it's an infinite uh, an infinite system, you can it it's applicable. It, you can apply it to much larger systems. And the reason that it was such a large, uh, such a small system is just because it, this is such a uh, computationally intensive analysis uh, of the material and um, and so you can actually uh, apply this to much larger volumes all right to actually to the actual size of, the, uh, of a real semiconductor in a uh, transistor and some of the future steps in this should be um, actually com uh, comparing that theoretical uh, orientation of the uh, longer crowd line to point defects to um, to experimental results and and actually seeing if we can uh, create better fabrication methods of the material to uh, decrease those uh, the lengths of those lines and uh, as well as um, taking into account that stress um, that stress level so even though these simulations were a uh, used stress as a percentage value in the future I think it's very possible you could act, we could actually model um, stress levels in specific parts of, of the system. So we we took the system to be the the stress to be in one uh, one direction, and then but in reality, each of those uh, second faults are are what produce the stress in the system. And if you have, uh, for example, the temperature of the system, the uh, the second fault areas. The uh, the den uh, the um, it uh, the actual den densities in specific regions. You can create a more comprehensive analysis of the actual state of the material at any point in time, and create um, a better um, analysis of the gliding nature of the dislocation of uh, of the dislocations and the deforming of the stacking faults. Um, all right, I would really like to thank. Um, uh, Professor uh, Suomitsu and Professor Nagasawa uh, from Tohoku University with whom I was working and um, also the Nano Japan program and the NSF uh, for their support. Thank you.